Hey guys, Pastor Tim here. Hope you're ready for another video from our youth group at Lighthouse Baptist Church. If this is your first time watching a video or you're trying to catch up on a missed lesson, we hope that this video is a blessing to you and helps you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Some of you guys saw in the note takers and we'll explain it here in a second. The lesson is entitled Be a Cloud, all right? All right, so we're going to read the first four verses and then we'll get into it. Starting in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1 says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, but for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree fall uh, toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not, shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Let me ask you guys this. Will a cloud continue to gather water or vapor, if you want to get all technical and stuff? Will a cloud begin, continue to gather water indefinitely? No, like, just not. continue. Why not, Gabe? It has to rain. It has to rain. No, at some point, it's got to let it go. All right? It's going to rain. And we call that when it rains and eventually gathers back in. It's called the... The water The what? Hydro. Hydro. Okay. Simpleton way, though, the water cycle. Although brief... All right, and there's a reason why this picture is used here in Ecclesiastes. All right, because a, a cloud is made up of water, vapor. vapor, and the Bible says vapor is here before a, moment. it's for a moment or a season. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> last whole season. So it's very significant of life as well. All right, although brief, life is filled with, you know, gifts to be enjoyed and stewarded for God and God's glory. Okay, many of the things that Solomon sees in life, he says they're what? They are vanity or vain. They're empty. They're pointless. All right? But it seems here you might be starting to understand that, you know, even these unsatisfying things in the world, all right, can be stewarded, stewarded in a satisfying way. All right? Does anybody remember? What does it mean to steward something? And we're all stewards of, of what God has given us. Uh, Josiah. Yeah, it's something that is not yours, but you are in charge of it. Yeah, uh, can anybody think of a better word for that, Lydia? Can I, like, take care of it and use it wisely? Use it wisely, to manage it well and so forth, all right? So, for example, what has God given us that we are to be stewards of? Uh, lock? Our bodies. Our bodies. Grace? Time. Time, that's a very good one. Ethan? The earth. The earth, yes. All right, God has given us many things, many gifts, talents, possessions, relationships and stuff as well that we should steward for his honor and glory. And a lot of those things as we've gone through Ecclesiastes have been things that Solomon himself has said is pointless. It's like, oh, well, you know, working's pointless. All right? But your job, the work, your labor can be something that you can steward to the honor and glory of God. All right? A temporal world can be invested into an eternal world. And what we're going to get at with this lesson, the next couple of lessons here as we go through uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, all right, in stewarding is that we want to learn to give. Okay, we want to learn to be generous as Christians, and that's not just talking about generous with our money, all right. But you can learn to give of yourself. And you guys, all the things you just listed as kind of things you can steward for God, those are things that you can give as well, whether it be to God or to others, and in, in, in ministering to others for God's glory. All right, learn to give. Our first point we're going to talk about then today is a good investment. All right, a good investment. All right, uh, verse 1 and 2, we'll just read it again really quickly. Uh, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. All right, what do you guys think he means by casting your bread upon the water? Any guesses? Rebecca? <laughs> Lock. No. Is it like no, uh, you guys aren't, I mean, it, it, it's kind of not a trick question, but it's, it's not very clear in the verse itself. He's not feeding ducks, all right, don't worry about that. He's not, he's not, he's like, you know, going to the park and just, eh. all right. Uh, but what it's most likely referring to here, when it says, cast thy bread, uh, is a reference to, um, into trade, all right? If you're in like, uh, it's a reference to grain trading via ships, casting your bread upon the water. All right, and the reason he says um, in verse 2, give a portion to 7 and also to 8, uh, he's talking about ships. All right, you can cast your bread or, 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 or trade it out and put it onto 7 ships or 8 ships. 
uh, and, and the verse ends, For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Why then would he want to spread out his commerce, the things he's trading out into multiple ships, because you know not what evil will come upon. Dax? Because one ship could be taken over and if you have everything, then all that will be taken. Yeah, yeah exactly. And not just taken over, we're not just talking about pirates, are, okay? Uh, <laughs> what are other things? What are other quote-unquote evil things that could happen to a ship? Luke? Uh, storms. Yeah, storm and stuff. Uh, Paul knew about that greatly in his life. Um, yeah, so the cast eye bread is a reference to grain trading uh, via uh, the shipping industry, and the seven to eight is to ships, all right, and just kind of diversifying that so that, hey, if one does go down, you're still going to uh, receive a reward or something from that trade because you're obviously not trading it for nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what it means there by cast eye bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. You're going to get a return on that investment, all right? Now, we already talked about stewarding. If you want to connect this as well, you know, the things you can steward, those are things that you can invest for the Lord as well. All right? So my time, all right, if I invested in myself, how would, I, uh, how would that be exhibited in my life? Luke? No, you're doing yeah, you're just doing things that you, solely you care about, solely you want to do. But if I want to invest my time for the Lord... How would that then be exhibited in my life, ladies? Great. Um, people would see you as a more honorable character. All right, I'm thinking more like, what would I do? What 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 can I do that shows that I'm investing my time for God, Lydia? You'll be at church Yeah, you'll be, be faithful in your church attendance. Any, any any other ladies? Second row, ladies. If you're investing your time, you want to use your time for the Lord. Mm -hmm. What are things you can do that shows that you're doing you're you're doing that? Amethyst. Bible study, yeah? You study your Bible. Do your devotions, things like that. Gentlemen, put your hands up. All right, so, uh, so you guys see where I'm going there, all right? You want to make a good investment. I want to steward your life for the correct thing, all right? You can see, just based on time, how you could do that in both ways, all right? If I wanted to steward my talents for the Lord, it's going to look far different than if I was just using my talents simply for myself. If I wanted to, obviously, the thing we could see the most, you know, steward my money for the Lord, it's going to look far different than if I was just stewarding it for myself or investing it in myself, all right? Instead of only solely being preoccupied with getting the newest uh, computer thing or phone or car or clothing, whatever it may be, I'm also concerned about, oh, well, hey, how can I help use my money to help with this thing or to help so-and-so uh, with their, with their uh, situation right now? You guys follow all right, um, the word cast, all right, cast thy bread, is, is a, a reference to total commitment. All right, because if you're casting something out, you're really not holding on to it unless you're casting out like a fishing line or something. All right, you're casting it out completely, okay? Um, it's a reference to total commitment as opposed to if you're simply wanting to invest in yourself, if you're simply wanting to steward the things God has given you for your own sake, we would call that not casting or being fully committed to God. We would call that, hey, I'm withholding. So you want to be, if you're making an investment for God, you want to be totally committed to that. All right? You guys understand that? There's no, God doesn't like a lukewarm Christian. All right? There's no sitting on the fence when it comes to God. You're either all in or you're all out. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. All right? So when I think of this, you know, I, I think of, um, you know, how many guys like to go to the pool? Okay? All right. Put your hands down. Now. I'm going to describe this to you, all right, and we'll ask in a second which one of, this, which one of these people are you, all right? But there's really two kinds of people that go to the pool, and I'm talking about that enter the pool, all right? <laughs> there's the crazy person with no abandon that as soon as he gets there, even with his flip-flops still on, he just throws his towel somewhere, and they just jump right in, cannonball, usually it's your guys, and stuff, like, oh, good ball, and... And, and stuff like that, wanting to break a big splash. They just go right in, all right? Reckless abandon, they're right into the pool. Then there's a different person. The person that comes, and you know, even though it's 110 degrees out and stuff, because they're wearing a bathing suit, they still have their towel over them because for some reason they're cold, all right? And they're going to the pool, and they don't go in. They go all the way to the shallow end where the steps are, and then they go one step at a time, Oh, okay, because the water's a lot colder than it is out in the sky, and they go in, and they keep going, and then eventually they get to that 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 belly button region, and apparently that's like the like when it gets really cold, and they're like, <laughs> and they just super slowly get in until 
Finally, they get up to their neck, and then the next precipice is like, okay, I have to dunk my head in the water. Oh, it's, oh. it's like torture. And, but how many guys have seen somebody like that? Like, they just take forever. To, all right, so put your hands out. If you are the reckless abandoned, jump in the pool, raise your hand. All right. Get it over with. Put your hands down. Get it over with. I know. If you are the test the temperature, wait for your whole body inch by inch to get acclimated to it, raise your hand. Wow, so we got, we got some honest people here. To make a good investment, to be all in for God, you cannot be the dip your toe in the water Christian. All right, and here's what I mean by that. You can't go in and just be like, oh, maybe I'll do this stuff as long as it doesn't seem like it's going to ask too much of me. All right, like, oh, the water's too cold. And then you're like, oh, man, I don't know if I can do that. That's asking to, I'm, and then you take yourself back out. So instead of going in and wanting to serve God, you have all the intentions to, but once you start seeing that it's going to cost you more than you want it to, or it's going to take more of your time than you want it to take because you want to do other things as well or do things with your friends, or it's going to cost, you know, I don't know, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to use my talents like that in front of people. You guys see where I'm going. It's whenever it seems like it's going to cost too much, a.k.a. the water seems like it's too cold, you get right back out, you put your towel back on, your, your flip-flops, and you're out of the pool. All right? If you're going to be committed to God, you have to be all in. I'm not saying you have to be crazy and reckless in how you serve God like you're jumping in the pool, but you get the idea. You're casting your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. You're committing yourself unto God like Ruth when she said to Naomi, you know, hey, where you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. That's how you should approach your investments that you're giving to God as well, investing your life in him. Uh, we are called, let me see what are my next thing. Yeah, go all in. All right, here's a good verse. We'll get to it in a second. Uh, we are called to purposeful, generous living, and it's in stark contrast to what the world wants us to do, which is simply to consume unto ourselves. Hey, just worry about you. You do you. All right, you do the things that make you happy. The uh, quote unquote what mentality? The, 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 the mouse? No, no, no. The Disney mentality. All right, turn over to Philippians chapter 2. All right, so we're going to read verse 3 and 4. All right. Verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So don't be preoccupied with yourself. See how you can serve. See how you can give unto others to God's honor and his glory. But in verse 3, I just love how it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. All right, what's vainglory mean? All right, it has that word vain at the beginning. It's not bad, yeah. It's thinking more of yourself than you should, yeah. Uh, seeking praise for the wrong reasons. Seeking praise. Pretty much you're occupied with yourself, all right? Are you making an investment for the Lord or stewing your life for the Lord if you're preoccupied simply with yourself? No, all right? And you're not fulfilling the purpose God has for you like we see in these verses of esteeming others better than yourself, seeing how you can serve and help give unto others and serve God in that aspect, all right? We're called to be giving, to be generous with our lives. All right. Um, Luke 6, 38. Remember in our passage says, after many days you'll find it again. You'll get a return on your investments. The life you give away will in some way come back unto you. God will bless you in that regard. Uh, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet or give out with all, it shall be measured to you uh, again. All right. Now don't, don't get this confused. This is not saying... You should shoot God like it's a, a karma thing, all right, or like a prosperity thing. Like, hey, as long as I keep giving out and doing the things I'm supposed to, God's going to give all these riches and such back to me. Is that, is that the right view we should have of God? Because understand, if you have that mentality in, in, a, in trying to live generously, you're not, you're not giving for the right reasons, right? You're still thinking of yourself. You're still working in that, operating in that vainglory type aspect. Okay, but God does bless a cheerful giver. Yes, all right, the blessings will come back unto you. All right, um, but let me ask you this. What is the greatest investment you can make in your life? Chris? Uh, by worshiping God. By worshiping God, that's not bad. Yeah, anything else? What's another great investment you can make? Second row, ladies. Alana. <laughs> Joanna. Other people's lives. Yeah, invest in other people's lives. Luke? Uh, 
to God? Give your life to God. You want to invest in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you put the gospel first in your life, all right, you can rest that you are in line with God's clear promises of provision and a life of eternal value. All right, because if you're investing in the gospel, you're serving God and you're seeing and you're putting others above yourself. Uh, Matthew six thirty three. Does anybody know what Matthew six thirty three says? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All right, seek to invest in God's kingdom. All right, our last point for this evening is a poor excuse. So we have a good investment. But we can also have a poor excuse. And this is where the cloud thing starts to come in. All right. And in verse 3 and 4, we'll read that really quickly. It says, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves. We said that at the beginning. A cloud just does not continue to gather in vapor. Okay. It's going to let it out. All right. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not read. All right, so Solomon first, he's using the picture of, of water or rain and trees, all right, to picture this uh, thing to us. Uh, but what he's describing is, we already said it, the water cycle, or uh, what was the other thing you guys call it? Hydrologic. Hydrologic. The hydrologic. Hydrologic. Man, wow. All right, so what are the stages in the hydrologic? I want to see if there's new words here, all right. What's the stages in the water cycle? Precipitation and condensation. Oh, okay, so it's the same. All right, very good. All right, well, I'm like, because yeah, back in my day, it was water cycle. All right, so, yeah, so we know there's a cycle to water. You know, the water's just not going to stay in the ocean. It's going to be evaporated. The water's not just going to stay in the cloud. It's going to come back down, all right? And that's important, all right? The cloud, in a way, and this is the picture here, the, the cloud's not pouring the water in, all right? That'd be weird, all right? It's not saying, no, no, I want to get really big. I want to be the biggest cloud, and, you know, no, it's going to eventually have to let all the water out. In a way, it gives back to the earth. The tree, he, he describes a tree that falls down. Why would a tree of natural way fall down? Not because some guy comes and cuts it down. Greg? It just dies. It dies. All right? And whether it falls toward, it's kind of like that, that, that question, you know, if a tree falls in wood and no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Uh, if it falls towards the south, that's where it's going to be. If it falls towards the north, that's where it's going to be. But he even describes a cycle there. What would this cycle be of the tree? All right, it grows, it, come be, it, it becomes being big and strong, and depending on what tree, if, you know, hundreds of years later, it's going to eventually fall down again. And then what happens, Ethan? A seed that falls from the tree, it, um, it falls into the ground, and it's watered. And grows. Yeah, there's, there's a, yeah, the tree also, when it falls down, when it's dead, does it just stay as a tree? No, it, it decomposes, it becomes mulch, it becomes good. Uh, things for the seed to, to germinate and grow in and become a new tree, yeah. all right? So he's describing these cycles. These things give back, okay? And a Christian should give back as well. Clouds don't keep water. Trees can't live forever, but they give back. Uh, let me see if I got that. So stop waiting, all right, to give. Give back now. The things God has given you, don't hoard it unto yourselves. See how you can use it for God's honor and his glory. It's in giving back that we are valuable and useful for God for God. And contrary to the clouds and trees, human beings, we don't want to act like that. We want to hoard it unto ourselves. We want to withhold it. All right, God, thank you for giving me all this time I have here on earth, but I'm going to use it all for myself. I'm going to hoard it. God, thank you for giving me all these talents that, that I'm blessed with, but I'm going to use it just for myself. You're hoarding it. You know, thank you for the job I have and the ability I have to work in this specific field, but I'm going to use all my money just for myself. All right? You're hoarding. And what's another word we use to describe somebody like that that just wants to use everything for themselves? Mm -hmm. They are, Joanna? Stingy. Stingy or selfish. selfish. All right? And a Christian is definitely not supposed to be selfish. The whole Philippians chapter 2 uh, mantra, you know, esteeming others been better than yourselves is the opposite of selfishness. It is, anybody? What's the opposite Self of selfishness? Selfish. Makai? Generosity. Generosity or an a characteristic? Selflessness selflessness or humility all right it's unnatural and impossible for a cloud to retain water without giving it back all right just says it's unnatural and impossible for you to have a full life in christ while trying to hoard and selfishly use all the things god has blessed you with all right you're like a cloud that's trying to become the biggest cloud in the sky it's, like, it's weird it's not it's, you know it's not natural all right, if you want to live a full life for God's honor and glory, you, you, you naturally want to give back of what God has given you. Uh, 
Let's think of this really quickly. In verse 4, he says, He that observeth, now this is what might hold us back, and it's kind of uh, the same with the pool analogy I used. But it says, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. What is this describing in that verse? He that observeth the, uh, what was it, the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds will not reap. Elijah. Not exactly, but you're observing it. Uh, somebody in it, Luke. Um, if you're looking at all of the things that other people have, you're like um, having like pride because you think more is me. Mm. No. If I'm looking at the cloud, like I'm a farmer, he's talking about sowing and reaping. And if I'm looking at the clouds or I'm looking at the wind and it's making me feel like, nah, I'm not going to reap uh, today, why would that be? Chris. Yeah, he's like, oh, it looks like it's going to be rain. It's right there on the thing, guys. It looks like rain. All right? Um, if he's regarding the clouds, if he's like, oh, the wind's really strong, I'm not going to do it. Oh, man, the clouds look kind of dark. It might rain. I'm not going to do it. He's just making excuses. And if he does that all the time, the Bible talks about in other places that a person that does this is going to go into poverty because eventually what they're doing, because they're always just getting this habit of making excuses, are they ever going to sell? Are they ever going to read? No. no, they're becoming lazy and they're making poor excuses. When I was at Pensacola, all right, PCC, I know some of you guys here want to go there. All right, so be warned. All right, Brother Patrick knows this. All right, unlike Texas, it'll rain in Pensacola. All right, and unlike when it rains in Texas, for some reason, it rains sideways in Pensacola. Okay? Like you're walking with your umbrella like this. <laughs> I literally, like, when Pastor Tim wanted to be like, you know, a knight in shining armor and want to help, like, you know, a girl get to the, the next building and stuff, I would be completely drenched on one side because you're trying to, like, cover her the whole time. And it's like, shh. But anyway, something I would do, and I'm not saying you have to follow this. This is a sad example, all right? But there would be times because it was like, when it rained, it was always like a deluge, like the times of Noah and stuff. And the rain would come down, and I would get at the, you know, I'd be in my room and I have to go to class and I get to the bottom of Young Tower and. And Young Tower was the dorm I was in, was far removed from all the other academic buildings. All right? And I'll get to the bottom of it, and I get in the lobby, and I just see out in front of me. <laughs> and there have been a couple times when I saw that, and I was like, I'm going to go take a nap. And I went right back up the elevator, got right in my bed, because we all know the best time to take a nap is when it's raining outside. It just does something to you. Don't do that. Do, do, do as I say, not as I do. All right? But here's what I'm getting at. That was a poor excuse, all right? I needed to go to class, all right? You know? And if I kept doing that every time it rained, okay, Pensacola had rules. If you miss so many classes, you eventually fail the class. And trust me, it rained more days than I could afford to uh, skip the class. If I kept making excuses, I wouldn't be here right now be, you know, flipping burgers because I never got my degree or anything like that. But here's what I'm trying to get at. Rather than making excuses, all right, seek to invest in God, seek to serve God, seek to give back, make a difference. Don't make excuses, make a difference. All right, you don't want your, uh, don't limit what you can do for Christ simply because, you know, you're not ready or simply because of the excuses. But here's the last thing I want you to, to get, all right. You don't want your generosity to be contingent, meaning you don't want it to depend on the circumstances. Okay? Oh, and this is how it comes up. Like, oh, I would do that if. Oh, I would give if I had more. Or, um, you know, when God allows me to have enough, then I'll, or when I have the time, then I'll do this at the church. Or uh, when I know more about the Bible, then I'll go witness to my neighbor, even though you claim to be a child of God, so you know what salvation is about. They're excuses. Okay? If I win the lottery, then I would... No, trust me, uh... That's not you can look up all the statistics on people that win the lottery. That does not happen. But you guys see where I'm getting at? You can't make your generosity, you can't let the times that you want to live, to God, live for God be completely contingent or dependent on ideal circumstances. Because guess what? The skies are not always going to be clear. The clouds are not always going to be nice, white, and beautiful. All right. The wind's not always going to be calm and breezy. There's going to be storms in life. All right, how many guys remember when Peter walked on water? All right, what was happening before Peter walked on water? Why were they all scared? All right, Dex. Jesus, uh, there was a storm going on, and then they got really scared because they saw this guy walking on the water, and they thought it was a ghost. All right, they literally thought it was a spirit, and they were fear, and then they realized, oh, it, you know, it's Jesus. 
But then what did Peter do? He said, Lord, what? If it, if it be you, let me come out there. And he gets on the water. And you know what didn't happen at all during that time? He didn't fall. No. He, he was, he didn't he die. The he thing that didn't happen didn't was God never at one point calmed the storm. Okay? He calmed the storm when he was sleeping in the boat, remember? And he says, peace be still. But the whole time when Peter was walking on the water, walking to God, the storm was still raging. The waves were still going on. The wind was still blowing. Uh, the clouds definitely were not white and beautiful. It was very ominous. But Peter was walking on water because he was focused on God and he wanted to be closer to God. Okay? But when did Peter start sinking? When he started looking around. When he started looking around, started looking at all the, oh man, the circumstances aren't ideal. Oh man, I wish I was still in my boat. Which, when he thought about it later, it's far better for me to be with Christ than in a little boat that was about to go down. And he started to sink. All right? You can't let your generosity, you can't let your will to live for God be completely contingent on ideal circumstances. Because they're not always going to be ideal. All right? And sometimes we forget that. Especially when we have this mentality of, hey, God, I've been living for you. You need to give things back to me. No, God doesn't owe us anything. God is the one who has blessed us with the things we have. God is the one, if you know him as your Savior, has blessed you with salvation. All right? We give our lives to him. Okay? Your generosity can't be contingent on ideal circumstances. All right? Are you driven by love for God or by you know, an ideal situation? I think I have your notes there, Mark 12, 45, 43. We don't have time, but I'll just reference it. This, that's the passage where um, the Christ and his disciples are standing by the treasury or the, 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 the money table and people are giving unto the Lord or giving unto the temple. And you might have some Pharisees that go by and are... You know, oh, I got these big bags, and they dump them in and stuff, making a big commotion. Uh, but who did Christ say gave all? Who did Christ say was the most generous? Makai. The, the, the widow lady. Yes, the widow that dropped, uh, the, I think the Bible said it, three mites. All right, which, sorry, I didn't do the math. You can look it up later. But it wasn't much. But why did Christ say she was the one that gave the most? Oh, my bad. All right. Luke. Uh, because she didn't give just to make herself look good. She yeah, she gave out of worship to God, out of love for God. She gave, and not only that, she probably gave all that she had. She was all in, all right? Don't have poor excuses, but seek to make good investments, all right? We are simply giving of what God has already given us in the first place, all right? When the cloud, when the cloud rains, what's going to happen to the water that just came out? It's going to come back and become a, a new cloud, all right? When the tree falls down, what's going to happen in the place where it falls down? A new tree is going to come up. All right? The things that you are giving to God in service of him are already things that God has given to you. And God's going to give it back to you over and over again. All right? You just have to be focused on seeking him and his kingdom and investing in the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm.